Ladies and gentlemen, here is Jan speaking, and I'm I'm honored to be the chair of this morning session. And the first speaker in the session is Joel Merker from Paris. The floor is yours. So the title of the talk is Differential Invariance, Recurrence Relations and Homogeneous Models in Branches and Subbranches. Please. So thank you very much for the invitation, and especially Pavel, who has a great influence on me. And what I will present is something rather elementary with some ideas. So scream, I would like to add the S with methods. So the context is to work with a finite dimensional group action on a manifold, ambient manifold. It displaces submanifolds, and the second order, third order ODEs can be put in this context, KLM distribution like 235, cauchy riemann manifolds, and completely integrable PD systems can be put in this way. So in Cartan's equivalence, met, uh, just one moment. So today's goal, sorry, is to divide by one. Why? It's because classically in equivalence methods, you divide by invariance, I, G, K, et cetera, because objects are functions. Differential forms are functions. Invariants are functions. And when some invariance is non-zero, one has to divide by I. I give one first example. You take a Gaussian metric on a surface. And then uh, I'm trying to avoid the scroll, but I cannot. So here is a curvature and its famous memoir of Gauss. We took 15 years to get this expression. And in the denominator, you have EG minus F squared square, which is positive because it's a metric, hence it is non-zero, and you are forced to divide by this. I'll give another example without just presenting the details because this is not my, my goal today. Consider a hypersurface in C3 graphed as V, which is a real part of the imaginary part of W equal a certain function phi of five variables. Introduce a certain function which comes from the Levy form, which is already not, not so easy to write down, which has seven terms up and, and down. And in certain uh, structures, you also introduce a CR vector field, A1 bar, which is as follows. And a certain non degeneracy condition expresses as L1 bar of K non zero. And this expression is 69 terms long. So my PhD student was able to conduct Carton's method of equivalence. So I just want to skip the description of the E structure he obtained. And also joined with Vego Fu, we finished uh, to construct the E structure that Pokela and I consider useless to finish at that time. But there are two primary invariants, G0 bar and W0. And I don't look at the secondary invariant R, but W0 and G0 bar really matter for me. And I want to emphasize that in the denominator place, you have L1 bar of K, which is this big expression. And also you differentiate several times K, for instance, in G0 bar, three more times, and there are more than 10,000 terms in terms of phi. So in a recent paper joined with Pavel, we were, or he was able to classify homologous models of para structures, which are inspired from these CR structures in slightly, you relax the condition of invariancy under uh, conjugation, under complex conjugation. And it is not difficult to see that what corresponds to the CR manifold is a P completely integrable system. ZY is a, a function of X, Y, Z, Z, X, Z, X, X. And Z, X, X, X equal H of X, Y, Z, Z, X, Z, X, X. And there is a compatibility condition when you make cross differentiations. So as we saw in a talk yesterday, the number of parameters which it depends on in three years is uh, Z, Z, X, Z, X, X. And by luck, this uh, quantity we had to divide in a CR context be becomes just a single monomial, F, Z, X, Z, X. But so again, we have in the process of Carton to divide by this. And here is the corresponding CRM in the para-CR structure. I don't want to really describe this CRM. It's again a structure equation of Carton type. And the invariants are writable. They are not 10 or 100,000 terms long. They are writable. And we realize that this is Wunschmann invariant is coming here. This is Monge invariant is coming. I don't want to enter really the details, but I want to emphasize 
that in the denominators, you see the invariants which do not vanish because later I will speculate on this. So here is the tree of uh, homogeneous models. So there are this invariant I3, which is the last one, which is the simplest one. And we were able to like find the list of homogeneous models, which is in this theorem. But I want better to speculate by an accessible talk instead of really presenting the result uh, about what, it, what really matters comes when you have to, to do some branching. So at least I want to make a little conclusion. In differential geometry, you play with functions, invariants are functions, and you have to force, you are forced to divide by functions. But what is, uh, what is a function really? So today I want to show you that Lagrange point of view, which says that a function is not really a function, it's a Taylor series, enables you to do the same kind of equivalence method with much lower computational complexity. So I want to remind that everybody knows that uh, in Lee and Cartan theory, we admit genericity assumption, which means that if we are in an open set and some quantity vanish somewhere in the red part, you relocalize consideration on a smaller open set and so on. More precisely, if you have some, if you encounter in your root some differential invariant P, which depends on X, Y, U, and the derivative of U as a function of X, Y, another invariant R, Q, et cetera, if there are relative invariants, this means that when you change coordinates, they are multiplied by a nowhere vanishing function. So the zero set is invariant under G. And you encounter plenty of these. And they are responsible for the creation of branches. So you have to divide the case where P is identically zero and P is not identically zero, but in the search for homogeneous models, for instance, in Lee's theory, in Cartan theory, because by homogeneity, if something is non-vanishing at one point, by transfer by the group action, it will be non-vanishing always at other points in the neighborhood, you make the dichotomy, which is logically not complete, either a relative differential invariant vanishes identically, or it is nowhere zero after restriction to a subset. So we exclude from exploration the case where there is some uh, red and green part mixed, as I showed in the picture. But there are two cases, and there are two difficulties. First, as I said, if P is not zero, you have to divide by P, and this is the reason why formulas explode, even for advanced computers. And when P is identically zero, there is a new difficulty which I really want to speculate on. How to express consequences. So I will stick to an element, very elementary example, because I don't want to pass to five variables when the computations are more advanced. I just take a surface. So now I'm starting something absolutely elementary and basic that you will understand almost everything, I'm sure, because it's very elementary what I just did. It's a bit philosophical. So you take a surface in R3, as U is called a certain function of X, Y, which I call F0. So it's a Taylor series, as I said. I want really to view like Lagrange a Taylor series. And I will look at it under affine transformation, for instance. I assume a very small hypothesis that the group I'm looking at contains <laughs> translations. Well, it's, it's cheap. And this means that after pushing the origin at some point of the surface, I can assume that f of zero is equal to zero, which is exactly g plus k equal one. And suppose, but I don't want to enter, enter the computational details because it's done on a computer. Suppose that you normalize this equation by the group action step by step, which means that you kill some Taylor coefficients or you put to one some Taylor coefficients. So I don't want to say exactly what's happening. So I assume that I understand that step by step, you normalize the Taylor series, U equal F0 is the starting, and F1 means that I have let the group action act once on the Taylor series, and F1 is a bit simpler than F0. F2 is the same, it's a bit simpler than F, F, F1, etc. So if I keep memory of how F1 depends on the initial Taylor coefficient, I can store in a computer the formulas or by hand, and then if I keep memory how F2 depends on F1, then I express F1 in terms of F0 and so on. If I do this until the group reduces to the identity of the origin, then this expression will give me the differential invariance of the structure. 
So it is not really proved in our paper with Chen, but it, we, we found it is automatic. So we did not even state and prove a theorem. And all, moreover, which is one key point, which is make a, a contrast with Cartan's method of equivalence is we proceed order by order. Sorry. And this is how there are some differences. So suppose that up to order new minus one, everything, all the job was done, okay? We set uh, maybe like 10 branches before. So now you have to look at Taylor coefficients and order new here, which are numerous in fact. So here is A. So assume, I don't want to really enter the computational details because it's more philosophical what I want to say. So U is a certain function of XY for terms of order new minus one. I suppose that all Taylor coefficients have been normalized, which is the M. Well, and I, the people online don't see what you are pointing. Sorry, you, you, you told me, but I forgot, sorry. So I will use a mouse. So the so U equal FN of GK. So these are the Taylor coefficients which are already normalized. And I let appear the Taylor coefficients of order new. And I don't, don't look at order new plus one. I don't care for the moment. So I assume that the group has been reduced to a certain uh, subgroup of the initial group, which means uh, that I call it G new minus one stab, which means that I have expressed how the group stabilizes this new minus one normalization. In true life, it might be a bit difficult to express this group, but suppose that it works. And now I take another surface on the right, so I took a surface on the left, which is normalized to order new minus one. I take, it's really equivalent. We have really always two objects simultaneously. And then on the right, suppose that you have another surface, which is similarly normalized up to order new minus one, which means that F and GK is exactly the same. So the, the co coordinates on the right are X bar, Y bar, U bar, but the Taylor coefficients are the same, no bar here. And then the order new Taylor coefficient might be different. And I want to use what remains in my group, which is a G, G new minus one stab, to simplify this F bar GK coefficient. So what do I do? So this, this is the diagram of successive group reductions. I don't show you like complicated example I'm playing with always, like Pavel is playing on Cartan's method as we are doing. It's always quickly complicated. I just give the general shape of the equation we are looking at. So it's zero equal to minus a certain non-zero quantity times FGK plus a certain non-zero quantity times F bar GK plus some freedom to normalize. Just this Taylor coefficient for G plus K equal new. And I, in fact, I give two general examples. The first example is minus A11 bar the square F21 plus A11 square A22 F21 bar. And in, I don't want to make details, A11 is non-zero, A22 is non-zero. So this means that F21 bar is a non-zero multiple of F21. So this means that at the level of Taylor coefficient, this is a relative in bar. Something after reduction to order new, new, new minus one, as I said. So I don't want to present uh, the step in which I am because this occurs in all steps. So this is a general shape. Uh, of stabilizer of order one, of order zero. It's just to, to fix the origin. So this means that you look at the isotropic subgroup of G, which fixes the origin, that's all. And then after you normalize the tangent plane to be horizontal. I started in, I am in order three already. I don't want to, I want to show you what's happening at each order. So these two equations uh, cover everything. At each order, everything will be of this shape. Yes, this, this I, I admit to be already done. So this is, uh, this at order zero is just translation. As I said, the group transla contains translation. So I'm done with this already. Yeah, so the one is linear. Yes, and the, because so suppose that you look at affine transformations and you make the, 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 the tangent plane to be horizontal. I don't want to, 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 to show all the branches before, just at one moment, how it branches and what happens, which is universal. It always appears like this. 
So the second equation, there is really a freedom to normalize, which is this group coefficient B1 multiplied by non-zero group coefficient. And there is F30 and F30 bar. I come back to this later. I start with this, this case. Okay. And now I explain you why with this power of series method of equivalence, it suffices to divide by one. Why? It's easy. Ah, what do you prefer? To divide by large differential polynomials with 69 terms or to divide by one? I saw, because I compared with the approach with the standard one and with the power series, and it was like a collapse of complexity, which was incredible because I divide by one. And why do I divide by one? It's very easy to say. It's because you look back to the first example, which appears a large number of times in all structures I studied. <coughs> F to one bar is non-zero multiple of F to one. A to two is a free group parameter. So you, you use it to be sure that F to one bar is equal to one. And then you restart the process. The, the, the normalized surface on the right, you put on the left with the, its F to one also equal to one, and also the right to be F to one bar equal to one. You restart the process. So you indeed only have to divide by one or minus one, but it's almost the same. However, if you want to be uh, safe about what we are really speaking about, hidden behind is a complicated differential invariance. I said to you that the Taylor coefficient F to one, if it is ex expressible in terms of the initial Taylor coefficient, it is the explicit expression of the differential invariance, which was behind. Of course, in this case, F21 has only two monomials. It's not complicated. But in, in further branches, it's more complicated than two. So, so what I'm saying is that instead of dividing by I21, as I said uh, in some examples, I divide by I21 at the origin. And it has value, which is just a, a number, a non-zero number. So after a dilation, it's just one. So I divide by one, as I said. So division by one works. And it worked with because I treated completely second order ODEs, CR manifolds in C2, I, I, CR manifold of dimension five. I treated surfaces either degenerate or non degenerate in R3 in the complex numbers. I treated also surfaces in C4, when I had 25 branches at some moment with some sub, sub, subset of this equivalence problem. And I was like completely crazy to see that there is a collapse of computational complexity. But, but what about the branch where is is identically zero? That's the main problem, but why? Because if F21, so this F21 I showed you is zero, you have to open a branch. So in Cartan's method, you have like, it is a function. So as I said, you assume it is identically zero. But if I know only it vanishes at one point, there is very few information about that. It, it just breaks down what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying? So I was. Absolutely. It is not seen. So you have to somehow grasp how to to. To, to have this, I, you have to somehow make a translation and renormalize, et cetera. So I don't want to really enter this. I want to show you that in what I'm saying, the power series method of equivalence has a real problem here. So I was thinking about this during two years. I know two answers to this question. I think I will not have time to, to, do, to explain the second answer, which is rather recent in my head and which is also extremely easy computationally. I will show you another thing, which is like dates back of uh, like before six months ago, which works anyway. So this is the second case when I can normalize F3 uh, zero bar. And as I said, I restart. I restart so I can skip this. And I can also skip this because I already said it. But now I come back to the main question. What when a differential invariant vanishes identically? Because if I know only the origin is zero, this is very few information. So I, I explain you something because I had this uh, idea during several years. And we, I wrote several papers with my students using this idea. So I want to, at least to present this idea, which is very close to what we have in Carton's method. 
It's the same, essentially. It's essentially the same. So suppose that on order U8, you have two invariants, F17 and F53, and they create uh, four branches like this, okay? And there is a proposition that I did not prove in papers, which is, which is true in examples, in all examples I deal, dealt with. If you do really express IGK, which is the FGK in terms of, of the initial Taylor coefficient, and you create the branch when it is identically zero, as I said, then always you have something which is the same derivative of F, F, X, G, Y, K, divided by some allowed denominator. What do I call a load denominator? Remember, up to order new minus one, I said perhaps there were many branches before. Some branches, some invariant vanishes identically, some other, it is non zero. So in the denominator, usually you find always a product of those invariants you encountered, which were non zero in your assumption, a product of this. So it's really rational, completely rational, but somehow in a like pedestrian way not with Rosenlich theorem, abstractly a posteriori, <laughs> but pedestrian like a algorithmic way. And therefore, once you know that F, X, G, Y, K is identically equal to some big polynomial divided by some low denominator, you can differentiate this expression several times to express the consequences. And I try to give some example, a very basic example, you take a surface with the Hessian, two by two Hessian, which is identically zero, and a Franck one. So after rotation, you can make that this uh, FXX upstairs is non zero. And you can solve FYY as FXY squared divided by FXX. And then you differentiate this differential relation several times to capture what I call the dependent jets. Another example we encounter some invariant W in the process. And again, W is an invariantization of F, X, 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 Y. And again, in W, you, you find F, X, 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 Y times something non-zero. So you can solve as this derivative is equal to some right-hand side, which is a load, et cetera. So this often happens, always happens in what I touch. And then suppose now a general example that you have like three differential invariants with vanish, for instance, they conduct you to these identically satisfied equations, uh, PDEs, in fact. And what I'm saying is that when you differentiate once more and several times these equations, all the Taylor coefficients in the red regions are expressible in terms of the Taylor coefficient in the white region. So this means what I call the dependent Taylor coefficients. And in the process, it's really a key you, you really have to do that. And Pavel showed me very clearly in what we dealt with together that in Carton sequence method, you need to do the same also. And also I've done it also with Pocula, with his PhD. I knew, I knew this very well. But again, I want to show you that the task rapidly becomes difficult to do. So suppose you, you, are, you encounter a, no, a new differential environment and it creates new quadrant, but now, there is this main question I had in mind since uh, like more than two years, I think, how to compute the dependent FGK in the red region cheaply? Because I have a non-cheap way to do it, but cheaply, it took me like a lot of time to, to get it. Maybe to, to, today I will just sketch orally what it is. But there is a natural way to do it. And with my, my, my student Chen, I said, there is no other way in a sense. So, it is to compute explicitly this invariance. So for instance, I31, as I showed you, it is a function of the initial Taylor coefficients. And when you differentiate it several times, you determine all the F, X, G at least three, Y, K at least one. And then you evaluate at zero. So this works, this works very well, but there is a price to pay because when you look, for instance, uh, at surfaces in C3, which rank to action, you come down rapidly to such a tree like this. Well, bon, it's not very complicated tree. Uh, so these are the Taylor coefficient of the three first, which create a branching and that of, of, of order four. And then what? The one which creates the first branching, which is this three zero looks like this. And then you have to differentiate it three times to finish the process. So Zhang Chichen with a good uh, programmer was able to do it. 
on this computer. We differentiated it three times, and we, 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 we were able to express the consequences in the red region to find the recurrence relations between differential invariants and also the homogeneous models. But they were, of course, classified much before by Dubrov, Komrakov, Rabinovich in 86, and also by Eastwood and Ejov in 99. In these papers, we don't see the branching of differential invariants. So this is what we really uh, uh, bring. And we also bring the recurrence relation in int branch between the, the, the differential invariants. So I don't want to really state the CRM because it's a bit technical. So we have a CRM like this. Suppose we are in the branch where G03 is equal identically zero, which means that this PDE is satisfied. With, there are 36 terms above. And when we, we compute the IF40, there are 426 terms. So when we differentiate, it's about 10,000. And then uh, it becomes like uh, we, we, we are believing that we are close to the limit of what is do, doable by a computer, although it's only in dimension two. So it's a bit frustrating. So anyway, we have uh, normalized uh, gra the graph equation. And then uh, we, we, we have the recurrence relation, which means the, the invariant derivative of this. So we, we look at the equation we have. We have also a moduli space of homogeneous models. So this I want to emphasize in the end of the talk. What do I, I will be clear later. So we show that there are remaining invariants which are not solved linearly. And there are a bunch of algebraic equations which tells you that in the current branch, homogeneous models are one-one parameterized by the points of this algebraic set, modulo discrete subgroup. And also, just quickly, we, we played with Lee Felsolver recurrence relation, which means that you have a differentiation of an invariant is equal to another invariant plus some uh, remainder, which is computed with Maurer Carton differential invariants. And if we assume that it is a homogeneous model, this means that they are constant, and then the differentials of this constant become zero here. And here, <coughs> we, we obtain only algebraic equation. I must really say you that it was really thanks to Pavel. I went in uh, like almost two years ago in, uh, in Warsaw. Pavel is absolutely unbeatable in, in computation. He's extremely strong. So he showed me what he was able to do on Tartan's model. So I saw, he, he told me that, oh, you, you got algebraic equations. And at that time, I was also trying to read a bit the papers of Olver. And I saw that indeed, these are algebraic equations. So in a sense, in Carton's method on the Lee Felsolver recurrence relation, uh, the, the same object is somehow reached. You understand what I say? So I, I understood that you can also like do some alternative to Carton's method and reach the core algebraic relations from the Lee Felsolver recurrence relation, which are somehow also implemented in Carton's method. And also what matters for me is that uh, these I could view as a Taylor series uh, coefficient, which was like more, more elementary from the point of view of computer, because you don't have to implement differential forms. So last thing to do, and, but in the paper of East, Eastwood and Ejov, this is not at all really uh, said in his paper. I think they are playing with this algebraic equation without telling us, the readers. So what I'm saying is that at the end, but I will show you the general uh, CRM, which is uh, provable, but maybe it will take two years to write the general theory down, write down. Maybe I go directly to this and I come back to uh, the infinite dimensional group actions. Ah, yes. So let me like uh, redo something which was already done by Carton, because I, I'm too pushed to renovate things or to redo things. It's my tendency because when I was young, I was renovating the house. So I, I cannot uh, 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 do something else. So remember the classification of Carton of hypersurface in situ. So this is in French. So you have six kind of models, some of which depend on parameters. And the proof of Carton did not really first in the beginning, the first part of, uh, of, the, of the memoir was to say that you know that by trace and segre, the dimension of the of the of the least symmetry algebra is at most three if it is not spherical, not, not the flat model. And then he took the 3D Lie algebra classification and he, he showed how it, it can be realized at holomorphic vector fields. And then in a second part 
of the, of the memoir, he confirms this by applying Cartan's method uh, independently. I want to show you another view on this CRM, which is like it goes to the same CRM, but it, it is with the technique of power series. So you start with a Moser normal form that I pre prefer to present later, which means that you have infinite number of coefficients, the group is infinite dimensional, and you normalize to zero infinitely many Taylor coefficients, and then it remains only a finite dimensional group, which is at most five dimensional. And then what? You analyze this equation I showed you, this F star, FGK, FGK bar, also at the infinitesimal level, sorry. And then you show that for a homogeneous model, all these Taylor coefficients should be solvable at order seven, at order eight. And there remain a certain number of Taylor coefficients which cannot be solved. And the computation is like one second. It, it took me three days to redo completely Cartan's, equivalent, uh, uh, Cartan's classification in three days with this method. But extremely efficient with no problem of explosion of computation, nothing. And then what, what, what I show, it's not difficult, as I said, is that if this remaining Taylor coefficient, so it is a function of three variables now, so it's F520, F440, F421, so it remains four real constants, which can be, cannot be solved linearly from the constraint of homogeneity. And then in the non-spherical branch, when F420 is equal to one after normalization, of course, homogeneous hypersurface in situ are simply transitive and one-to-one -one parameterized up to discrete equivalence by the following variety. So this means that each point of this algebraic variety in C4, no, in R4, sorry, in R4, correspond to one homogeneous model in Cartan's list. So I checked that you recover exactly what you did. So I made no mistake, I checked this. But the interest of this is that you have a precise also Lie structure, the Lie algebra structure. Of course, you can say that Cartan is finer because it, he, he has decomposed this algebraic variety in branches. But what I want to say is that in many equivalence problems, something is really missing is really the tree, the branching tree of invariance. So there are classifications which say, oh no, 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 computations are too difficult. And then we do, do some other tools with Lee theory because it becomes undoable. So here with this approach, you have the Lie algebra for all elements of this. So this means that you unify the six uh, branches. And if you want, you can decompose because you, you can express whether this Lie algebra is, uh, uh, is um, simple or not just by a determinant. So there is an algebraic equation I did not write, which expresses because in Cartan's uh, list, there are three, the last three for which the, the structure is SL2. So here with this, once you have, what I want to say is that with the equivalence method, this is what Pavel said to me, understood deeply. He said that Cartan's equivalence method gives you really decomposition into branches. So you're sure that they are not equivalent. This is key point. And also it's also the, the, the case. And furthermore, you get the least structure like in uh, more Cartan equations, but with much lighter computations. That's what I observed. Now I want to somehow tell you what I said already, but in, uh, with figures, I sketch the general shape of the equivalence method because it's rather like uh, good for a computer and easy to, to understand. So suppose that you have a certain number, number of branches where some invariants vanish identically. This means that you have some dependent jet uh, coordinates or dependent uh, monomials here. And here in green are the phantom invariants, the one you normalize to zero or one during the process. And between them, there are some blue ones, okay? If you don't want to search for homogeneous models, this means that all the blue remaining dots will correspond to a differential invariant. So this means that completely free Taylor coefficients. And when you over invariate them, they are differential invariants. So first job, which you, what Oliver was doing in, in almost all his paper on the su subject, he was not searching for homogeneous model. He said, no, no, I want to understand the, 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 the algebraic structure of what remains is the blue dots, which are not phantom and not dependent. And in fact, in all this paper, you never see some dependent region, okay? 
But then, if you want to seek for homogeneous models, again, I skip the details because uh, it's, uh, I did not even time to prepare. So you find that a lot of stellar coefficients become expressible in terms of some others. You don't know the, which ones. So this means that all the red, underlying red Taylor coefficients become expressible. And even after some order, all, the, all are expressible. I did not underline this in, intentionally. So this means that the red part is eating everything to infinity, eating. But some are remaining, which are the four here, as in Carton's uh, theorem I, I stated, four are remaining here, which cannot be solved linearly. This is where I, I, I keep them as a core algebraic variety in these four uh, uh, coordinates. And I call them core parameters. And it's really like it was beautiful when I've done this. It was, I started to do this in November last year. I had, for instance, 100 equations, algebraic equations remaining in my head from the conditions that I need a homogeneous model in four variables. I took one by one these 100 equations some were three lines or 10 lines long. I, I asked Grubner basis to tell me what is this? Usually Grubner basis are unable to do anything, but it was incredible to me. Immediately I received four equations instead of 100 saying the ideal is generated by only four, four equations instead of 100. So I was really the impression that first I made no mistake and that it was magic because usually I, I played with this on, on algebraic geometry. It never worked essentially. But here it's like magic because as I said here, this is the way I found these equations, not by hand. I have like a, a lot of algebraic equations and then there is something hidden behind. And it occurred in all structures I played with later. This is a good thing. And now I can set like very general and very informal CRM, which is of course not proved uh, because it will take a lot of time to write the theory. So suppose that as I said, you have some branches zero, non-zero, et cetera. Maybe there are like five stages like in the picture and you reach some end in which, in which uh, the group reduction is finished. It might be this remains some isotropy of course. And then I say, that homogeneous models are one one parameterized moduli space, modulo, of course, discrete action, which I don't understand yet, by some invariant algebraic variety with explicit equations in the core parameters. So, in four or five different structures, it was always true what I said. And now uh, it, it remains to me like five or 10 minutes. So, I come back to Moser normal forms because I did not present this. So now what about infinite dimensional Lie group actions? Because I, I said, I restrict to finite dimensional group action for the moment. By luck, it's essentially the same. It will be essentially the same, the same picture. For structures whose symmetry algebra is at most finite dimensional. So again, G acts on a, the manifold, on a manifold N until if the dimension of the group is finite, the jet space is increases exponentially the dimension. So the orbits are small in the jet space. This is how Oliver always proceeds. And then there are differential events. So what about dimension of G is equal to infinity? And I say that some so point carry more their normal form, the action boils down to a finite dimensional group action. So we, we did uh, a, a little job with uh, Vegofo, which is not in the literature recently. In fact, it was mainly Vegofo who, who done, done it. And uh, I like the proof he, he obtained. So you take a second order equation under fiber preserving transformation. A lot of paper by Cameron using Carter's method are on that. And we, we found a normal form in the sense of more, the, more precisely after analytic change of coordinate, you can make the right hand side of the ODEs to be satisfying these four conditions. And the stability group now becomes three dimensional at most. And for the model, it is three dimensional. Why second equal zero, it is so. And we also did the classification of homogeneous model. I did it in December with this new method in three days also. It was extremely quick. There were some like, uh, like seven or 10 branches, I don't remember. Uh, my student also redid it uh, uh, like easily. 
because the method is much less, much more economical than what I practiced before. And now I give another example, a hypersurface in situ. So it is something uh, which I also already spoke about. So you have two coordinates under the biomorphism of, of C2. And then a biomorphism is uh, some FGK, ZG, WK. W prime is some G, GK, ZG, WK. And then a graph hypersurface is uh, you have three, three coordinates, Z, Z bar, U power L with conjugation. You have also the Levy determinant, which is assumed to be non-zero. And then the Moser CRM tells you that you can kill a lot of Taylor coefficients. And I draw this uh, like intuitively. This is the red part, which you can kill step by step. So I don't want to enter the details. So there is a subtlety about uh, chance. I don't, uh, again, want to enter the detail. But the, the main thing for me is once this normalization of Moser is admitted, then the stability group is at least at most five dimensional. This is what I want to say. So now everything boils down to what I already said, because now it's finely dimensional group action on some jet space. And the jet space or the coefficient space is the remaining Taylor coefficients which are written here. Okay, so this is uh, very uh, well known. And then to finish the talk, it's good that I don't go farther, I want to just mention something because I don't want to answer really the, the details because it's boring. Uh, recently, applying the same method in a joint paper with uh, Vegofu, Teanta, and Pavel Nurovsky, we were able to apply this method to find homogeneous models and the branchings for certain class of five dimensional CR manifolds. So you take the model is a this uh, algebraic representation. So it is a representation of the cube over the light cone. I'll again, skip, skip details. The isotropy group of the origin depends on five real parameters. This is written like this fractional linear, uh, fractional algebraic uh, transformations. And the general uh, is a perturbation of the model. This means a general hypersurface is this model, uh, this model I showed, uh, uh, Plus, normally it's zero for a second order OD, it's zero plus some perturbation. Sorry. And then you, you expand this in Taylor series and you want to normalize Taylor coefficients like Moser. So there is a, a theorem of Kolar Kosovsky in 2019 that we reprove with Fu and T on Ta. It says that you can make this Taylor coefficient vanish, the, even these functions, all these functions. So it's difficult, it's like 50 pages of technical proof. So I don't want to enter the details. And then uh, what about homogeneous models? Because in these two papers, they were not treated. They were treated by Felskaup in Acta Mathematica in 2008 with purely algebraically theoretic method, but we did not have the view of equivalence, the view of branching tree, et cetera. So we did it. And uh, the, the, the answer, is the following. So you have a simple branching tree like this. So these are uh, Taylor coefficients of five variable uh, functions. And it's very simple tree. And if no, no, this is non-zero, you can normalize uh, everything of the isotropy. So it becomes simply transitive. And then the, in one branch, uh, this is a CRM. If you call theta the remaining, remember I, I spoke about core, core parameters. In this case, there remain only one, which is good because uh, we knew already that for surfaces in C3, which are parabolic, it is the same. And we knew also from, from uh, Felskar that it's the same. So I confirm what, the, what he proved with a completely different technique. And we have a CRM in which we have normalized the Taylor series up to order 10, for instance. Of course, computations are not trivial. Okay, they're done on computer. And the, the general infinitesimal CR automorphism depends on five real constants, and its coefficients are like this. But I want to say that uh, when Pavel did the same job for the para CR structure when he was in Paris using Cartan's method of equivalence, I was really impressed because I couldn't have done it myself. But later, well, like one year and a half later, I was able to, to do it myself. Uh, with this power series method of equivalence, which is less complicated computational. So I think I can stop uh, today. Uh, now it's a bit earlier, but I don't care.
Let me thank you, Joel. Actually, we, we are just in time because there should be some time for discussion. So what about, what about questions, comments, remarks, either from here or from the other side, the online part of audience? When you normalize the KZ as the origin, and you have some invariant which is identically zero, so and this this is a problem to understand higher order uh, invariants for homogeneous case. Uh, uh, so in fact, what you can do is just uh, uh, to compute uh, the normal form for K Z, uh, but not at, at the origin at, at a point epsilon with coordinates uh, epsilon. I remember you gave a talk in the Greek seminar. I remember this yesterday. Yeah, this and is also what I try to do. Uh, and then uh, takes just the linear approximation in respect to epsilon, which gives you, in many cases, rather simple equations uh, yes. uh, for the uh, invariant of order, of order k plus one. But I have uh, another uh, way to do it, uh, which uh, is even more economical. I just, I did not have time to prepare this on this slide, is to express. So there is a key point, which I somehow intentionally have hidden in this talk. But I, I tell you orally, is that in Carton's method, you'd never reason infinitesimally until the end, when you get more of a Carton equation with constant structure, constant, uh, uh, constant uh, torsions, remain, constant, constant curvatures. But in the process I'm uh, describing, there is a key simplification. First of all, I said you normalize one surface to another surface, you normalize the coefficient, and then you express the stability group. But furthermore, I express a linear high stability group, which means that I express tangency to a symmetry. And these are purely linear equations. And what you said, to find the dependent jet Taylor coefficients, you can either, either first express explicitly the environment, which is very possible, as I said. Second, push to epsilon the origin renormalized, which is a bit costful, I, I compared, but it's less costful than the explicit expression. And third technique, is to express the tangency of a symmetry, and then by magic, you get the dependent jet with almost no complication, which is for essentially the infinitesimalization of push to epsilon the origin. So I view this like least philosophy. I always infinitesimalize. So I get I I, did, I understood this like uh, two months ago only, because on computer I can just test whether it is true or not yeah. in several structures. So I got it very very quickly. But the key point is to do in parallel, not only the normalization, but also the linearization of the normalization, because at the end, you want a homogeneous model. You want a vector field with a Liège bar. So I do it parallelly, which is in Carton's method. I did not see it is. So this is why in the, in the abstract, I have this idea since, since like November last year, how to somehow enhance Carton's method so that you have more information at each step. This I do not really know, but this is, in my, in my opinion, a good question. No, in this uh, philosophically uh, relation between this method and Cartan method is just uh, the necessity to um, uh, having uh, Taylor series of analytics uh, function to compute it at, at all points nearby. Absolutely. Which is some kind of connection. Absolutely. But it is not formalized. I mean, I would like to remind that we shall have afternoon a discussion session on homogeneous spaces. So maybe such a detailed discussion could be pushed there. And, and uh, we can have one or two more quick questions to the lecture now. Are there any? Maybe then I have one. Because, I mean, you didn't mention much about the beginning. What is what means the generic position? So, so if the hyper, if the hypersurfaces say in C two are not regular, but but say highly non-regular CR geometry, so the 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 canonical forms are still convergent and everything works. No, no, I mean the no no. If it is not CR, if it, the the CR dimension jumps. Huh? There are a lot of works by Moser, Webster, and also Huang, which tells you that you come down to a small divisor problem. But okay, so, so you, you just start the branching with restricting to the regular ones. 
Yes, as many people do in differential geometries, you have a log, when you have a flag, yeah. or there are, first there are a flag, you assume constancy uh, of rounds, etc. I do, I do uh, accept this principle. Of course, uh, a lot of people are, are working with singularities, as you said, and I worked in CR geometry during 15 years with like very degenerate structure, which are not of constant type, of course, mm -hmm. with in analysis mainly, not in yeah. uh, differential geometry. Good. This is true. So Thanks. there are open problems in this area. Thanks. Some more questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. So let me thank Joel again.